Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast. Uh, the Legendino is in Rio, which I've got to say, uh, for once, Tim, well, not for once, but certainly it is the place to be with regards to the football match that we're going to look at uh, well, going back. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a fair way. It's a big place, South America. So it's a fair way from Colombia. It's a six-hour flight from, from Colombia. And it's uh, even further away from from Tokyo, where this game took place. Yeah, when you put it like that, I guess I may as well just bring in our guest, David Arrowsmith, <laughs> who has written a book called Narco Ball. Narco Ball, David. Uh, I've heard of many different kinds of... I mean, Tim's always going on about um, Ange Ball nowadays, <laughs> him being a spud. It's the way we play, mate. <laughs> Fat lot of good is doing you, mate. Um, David, why Narco Ball and what is it? So this is the story of Colombian football, really, um, told through uh, the lens of the rise and fall of Pablo Escobar, um, alongside the rise and fall of the era that I'm sure a lot of your listeners will be a little bit familiar with of Colombian football. So really the 80s and early to mid 90s, which is when Pablo and the cartels really took over life in Colombia um, and rose to the top and had a huge impact on both the domestic game and the international game of football in Colombia. I, I think we've talked about this many times, Tim, but um, until you read David's book, I don't think you quite realise to what extent the drugs cartels in Colombia controlled football, certainly in Colombia, and its impact went beyond Colombia, of course. Well, controlled everything. I mean, Colombia at the time was La Colombia, the, the, crazy, the crazy country. Uh, and, and sometimes when I think about this, and it, it seems like a crazy episode in history, but it's got kind of repercussions with the world now, I think, because you take away the cartel bosses and you put in the tech billionaires and there's a, there's, there's a, there's a similar kind of, well, we can do anything. We can do anything we want behind it. Uh, hence the fact, I think, that the story that, that David is going to help us tell is both fascinating in itself and relevant for the, for the modern day. Okay, before we get to the match, which is the um, Intercontinental Cup, for those who remember it, of 1989, 17th of December, in uh, Japan, in Tokyo, and it was uh, Atletico Nacional of Colombia versus AC Milan with, amongst other, the absolutely brilliant Marco Van Basten. And he plays a central part in the match as well. But before we get to that, David, give us a background. How did the likes of uh, Pablo Escobar, and it wasn't just Pablo Escobar because his rivals or his competitors, if you like, were of the Cali cartel. They were also you know, fed into the uh, fragments, the fabric of uh, Colombian football. How did they get to where they were is that the right place to start or not yeah i mean absolutely they were sort of wove wove themselves really into the fabric of of colombian football um from the very late 70s but really in the early 80s is when it is when it really came to a head um so pablo uh took a major interest in atletico nacional who are the team from Colombia we're going to focus on, I think, today, but also had an interest in in their, their crosstown rivals, um, Deportivo Independiente Medellin. So he was invested in the two Medellin clubs, which is where he grew up in Medellin. Um, and uh, his partner in the cartel, who was based in Bogota, um, uh, a, a guy who went by the nickname El Mexicano, um, he was uh, took over the interest in, in Millonarios, uh, which was also one of the, the biggest clubs in the country. Um, and then the Cali cartel um, really ran, excuse me, America de Cali, which was one of the two big clubs in Cali. And so all all the kind of big players in, in the two biggest cartels at the time, the Medellin cartel and the Cali cartel, had serious interest in, in, in these football clubs. Um, and especially for Pablo, I think it was much more than just a way to launder money. I think initially it was a really useful way to launder money. Uh, a lot of it was cash game back then. You've got thousands going through the turnstiles. You've got, you know, very poor record keeping of transfer fees and, and salaries and all that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a great way to launder a lot of money, which obviously he had a huge need for. Um, 
But I think he also loved football. Um, I think he also desperately wanted to court popularity of the people and the masses of Medellin. And I think especially when he had political aspirations that I think a lot of people uh, outside of Colombia maybe are not so aware of. But I think he had a real ambition to potentially even be president of Colombia. And he had been elected a suplente to uh, Colombia's parliament, a stand-in. Um, for the regular sort of MP, as it were. So he had a place in Parliament, <clears throat> which means he had parliamentary immunity and criminal immunity, and potentially immunity from extradition to America. But when he lost that, when he was outed as a, a narco um, very, very publicly, and he had to quit politics, he needed something to replace that, really, to protect him. And I think football became the thing that he leaned very heavily on he thought if he could win the hearts and minds of the people of Medellin and of Colombia by bringing success to Colombian football, he could kind of be above the law. You know, he could be so loved and so powerful for his influence in football um, that that would protect him from the war on drugs from America and from the Colombian regime. Essentially, this is the Godfather. I mean, it really is the, God, the Godfather story, but kind of with an attempt to speed it up a little bit. You know how <laughs> he wasn't a patient man, was no. he? Pablo? Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> and that second part of The Godfather with Robert De Niro it is long, it goes on forever and ever and ever because yeah. you, you've got the illicit money, you've got the desire to clean the illicit money, but also to clean the family and become legitimate in some respects which no, was part of the, the, the delirium of, of the whole thing. I, I agree 100% with the motives that they're involved. I mean, until this day, football is fabulous for laundering money internationally. It's fabulous for, for, for that. Um, and there's also the, 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 the PR, you know, in, in, in a place where the state is absent, you become the state. Uh, and there's the third reason, they're actually into it. They're football fans as well. And Escobar himself may well have been a fan of, of the other team, of, of Medellin, rather than Atletico Nacional. But it's Atletico Nacional who project themselves. And that's fascinating in itself because the big, uh, uh, as America of Cali, they're buying everyone. They're buying players today who would be household names in European football. And the most famous, I think, for a European, and Brown was there, you know, the, the Argentine centre-back who scored in the, in the final of the 86 World Cup. But, you know, the, the kind of players that they were, they were bringing in, especially from Argentina, there's always been a strong link between, uh, although they're opposite ends of the continent, they're very, very different countries. You know, when Colombia launched its Pirate League in the, in, the, the late, in the late 40s, outside the auspices of FIFA, it just so happened that Argentina went on strike. The players went on strike. So hang on a minute, we'll go down there. We'll bring, and they brought the best ones, you know. So there's always been that 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 connection. But the the the, the fascinating thing for me about about this story is now we've got a fella on the world football phone in listener, lovely old fella. He's in his eighties, and I sympathise because there's things I can't get get me head round. And the thing he can't get his head round is there are so many foreign players in English football. Surely this is having a detrimental effect on the national team. And we have to talk him down from the ledge every time. You know, when there were no foreign players in the, in the English league, we didn't qualify for World Cups. Now there are lots. We're getting to finals of stuff, you know. But then again, you can prove anything with facts. Um, but the, the thing that, that fascinates me about these years in Colombia is there is, apart from the money side and all of this crazy stuff and referees getting murdered and the, the championship getting cancelled and, and, and political authorities and judges are getting murdered all over the place, they bring a plane down, for crying out loud. The cartels bring a, bring a plane down. They wanted to get someone who was on the plane, you know, so down it comes and who cares about the, the collateral damage. So amid all this madness... There's something that happens in football terms because the first Colombian team that wins the Libertadores de South America's Champions League is not America of Cali with all these foreign imports. They get to the final three years in a row, they lose all three. It's Atletico Nacional. And Atletico Nacional have a policy at this time that Nacional thing is important. National. No foreign players. So amid all of the, all of the imports, Colombian football finds a way 
to establish its own identity. Uh, and that, that, that process in the midst of all, all of all of the, the off the field madness, that process is valid in football terms. Uh, and uh, I, I, find, I find that fascinating, that dialectic, if you like, between all of the madness of the money and all the foreign imports and the formation of a side using only Colombian players who find a Colombian way of playing and are very successful as, as a result. And, it, and it's so translated to the national side, you know, instantly, isn't it? It's, uh, so Atletico Nacional's manager at the time was also the manager of the Colombian national side. Much easier um, to do in those when days he was because a, there are so, so yeah. few fixtures. And they qualified for the World Cup um, in 1990, I think playing six games. So it's easy. It's much they, yeah. easier to, to combine the two jobs. Very different to the to the to the grueling qualification today. Um, but it meant that 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 manager Pacho Maturana, um, who, who was managing he's black. both sides, and to this day, yeah. it's hard to find black coaches in Brazil. You look at Colombia, and there's there, 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 there's lots of them, and Maturana is 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 the main one. And his his system, like you say, of having. Um, an entirely Colombian squad. He was Colombian himself. Um, they built this nucleus of young players. A lot of them l- l- very local players, not just Colombian players, but Medellin boys who had grown up on pitches in the barrios that Pablo had helped develop and build and put floodlights into and opened up ceremonially himself. Um, that nucleus of players was were the players that played at Wembley in '88, coached by Maturana. Those players were the players who he took to Italia 90. Um, and most of those players went with him to, to USA 94. So it, it was very much that Nacional, yeah, had that very Colombian feel. And so, you know, one of the things about this game of Atletico Nacional against AC Milan is it's not just a, one of the Medellin sides against a Milan side. It's an entirely Colombian lineup you know, very much representing a country, a continent, and coming off the back of um, some really sort of inflammatory comments uh, from the the Milanese side, um, talking about, you know, Colombia being sort of the dark part of the world and the sort of dirty country that they were going to win for sort of truth and light and honesty and all those kind of things. Um, and so it became a sort of very much... The, all, all, of those things, us, all of those things with which Sir Silvio Berlusconi has been so identified. <laughs> well, yeah, I was thinking of Jonathan Aitken, who was the Tory. And, you know, to be fair to him, he is a kind of... He has... Um, he has redeemed himself since then, but he was the Tory grandee that was... Uh, being um, exposed in the media for, um, well, handling brown paper envelopes, let's put it that way. And then he decided to take the Daily Mail or whichever paper it was to court. And he had these famous lines that he was here to brandish the good old British sword of truth or something like that. It was a famous line that you can Was it the good old British sword of, of blatant hypocrisy? That as well at the time, although, yes. like I say, Tim, he has redeemed himself. I've got to say, it's uh, the prison was uh, a um, you know, correction, an illuminating correctional, yeah, correctional facility was an illuminating experience for him. But what I was going to ask, though, David, it's clear from what both Tim has said and what you've said that the cartels the Escobars, the Carly cartel, well, maybe not so much the Carly, but I imagine there as well, that they weren't just football fans. They weren't just uh, the bankers, bankrollers of this influx of uh, great players from Argentina and elsewhere and also developing uh, football in uh, Colombia. But they also seem to have been the, you know, archetypical... um, you know, in, in, in infuriatingly meddling um, <laughs> owners of the football club, not just the uh, the domestic football club, but the national football club as well, that they could decide who got to play and who didn't get to play, if at the very least by issuing a threatening warning that if so-and-so plays, there will be fatal consequences. How do you develop a football under that kind of pressure, and this is significant 
certainly for one of the players um, in this match that we're going to talk about, the international, um, the Intercontinental Cup. Yeah, I mean, I think part of what I wanted to do with this book when I when I kind of wanted to tell the story of Narco Ball was I was a teenager during that 94 World Cup. And I think I was I was avidly supporting Colombia, watching every game um, in London as I grew up on the telly. Um, and I was just so, you know, after the victory in Buenos Aires, the 5-0 um, and going into that World Cup, I was so excited for the possibilities for Colombia after, you know, sort of showing the world in, in Italian 90 that, that they could play a bit. 94 felt like a real moment for them. And then when that went so horribly wrong and then when what happened afterwards happened that you alluded to, the, the assassination of Andres Escobar, you know, I guess I was sort of slightly traumatised as a teenage boy, football mad, half Colombian. Um, and in writing the book, I wanted to understand what had really happened, what really went wrong. And I wanted the sort of casual observer from across the ocean, from thousands of miles away, to get a sort of new understanding of the extent to which the cartels were embroiled in all of this and the incredible pressure that those players and those coaches were under in that campaign. And I think if you think of, if you were to imagine what happened at USA 94 to the Columbia squad happening to any international squad now, you just you just would think that is unbelievable. You would say that nobody could take to the field under those circumstances. You know, whole tournaments might have to be cancelled if something was happening like that. So it's it's just unbelievable. So I, I wanted Pete, I wanted to understand it and I wanted my readers and, and fans to kind of understand that full context. How much do you think of the tragedy of 94 is linked to the death of Pablo Escobar a few months earlier. Had the team lost I, I think its protector? It, it, I think there's a big part of it that is that. I th and I think a lot of people maybe don't quite know, even know the full timeline. Um, it does get, you know, as so much is happening at that time. And we in the West and in the UK were quite removed, you know, geographically. And it was a, a bigger world back then. We weren't as connected to instant news and the internet and Twitter or X or whatever. Um, and so I think everybody kind of conflates all of those events when it comes to Colombian history and Colombian football. And actually, as you say, Tim, es Escobar, Pablo Escobar, died at the end of 1993, on the 2nd of December 1993. Um, uh, he, he didn't get to see the World Cup in America, um, but what happened was with his death, there was a real kind of power vacuum. Uh, the Cali cartel are kind of trying to sweep everything up and gain, fully gain the upper hand. They've been in pretty much all out war with Pablo by that point for a, a good little while and have been kind of surreptitiously helping the authorities and kind of doing their own thing as well to undermine him and, and take him down and attack the people around him and his family. So going into that World Cup, as you say, the coach, you know, was the coach of his club side. Um, that, that he was bankrolling Atletico Nacional. A lot of the players were from Medellin and, you know, had been effectively, you know, on his salary. Um, and he was no longer there. And so it was, I, I, I totally agree with you, Tim. I think what happened would not have been allowed to happen if Pablo had still been alive. Those messages would not have been sent. Those threats would not have been made. Um, and, you know, history might have been a little bit different for better or worse. And certainly... Andres Escobar, who was killed after scoring the own goal against America, shortly, very shortly after he got back to Colombia, after they were eliminated in, in the group stages of that World Cup, you know, he was gunned down in a in a Medellin nightclub car park. Um, and again, that was much less likely to have happened, and the repercussions of that would have been much larger if Pablo had still been alive. This was the golden boy of Medellin, of Atletico Nacional, the new great hope for Colombian football. He was on the cusp of signing for AC Milan, who was about to become sort of the biggest, most high-profile footballing export for Colombia, really. Um, so Pablo's death, I think, created a huge imbalance and sort of power vacuum that absolutely caused untold problems for the, for the squad, especially. Escobar, Andres Escobar. It's a special footballer, isn't he? And a, and a, a special, I mean, he's, as a young man, he's thrust into the team and he almost instantly becomes the leader. And he's a little bit like uh, Angel later, who also came up with, you know, the Aston Villa striker, also came up the ranks with, um, with Atletico Nacional. He's a middle-class kid, Andres Escobar. 
very well educated, well read, uh, and just a wonderful footballer, a really, really good footballer. And so much of the story of this Columbia team goes between the two goals that he scores at Wembley in 88, where Columbia come of age and get a draw. And then the, the, the one in, in, in the States in, in 94. Uh, and you can see in this game that Escobar can play for Milan. Because one of the fascinating things about the game is the two sides are very similar. Mm. Even though they've arrived at this point from different different start, different jumping off points, they're very similar teams in a way. Milan, Front foot. Yeah, and Milan with, with Arrigo Sacchi. Now, they've come off the sweeper thing in Italy. And they've gone 4-4-2 with Baresi as the main man, in the, uh, organising the defence and playing out and the midfield that squeaked. Carlo Ancelotti as, as the number 10. Uh, and I, I've always thought that Italy had a, would have had a much better chance of winning the World Cup in 90 had Ancelotti not been injured during the course of the competition. But 4-4-2, playing in lines, pressing. And that's what Nacional are doing as well. And this is at a time where Argentina just won the World Cup with three centre-backs. Brazil are following suit. They just won the Copa America with three centre-backs. It's, it's the new wave. But Colombia and Maturana, they're doing something totally different. Playing in line, you've got to be quick. You've got to have quick centre-backs to play that way. And Escobar was quick and he was, he, he was classy. And Maturana thinks his team has got an advantage. And that advantage is called René Higuita because... And a lot of this, it, it's fascinating to me, the way that ideas bounce around in football. A lot of this is taken, in fact, both sides really, a lot of this is taken from Holland, 74, where uh, Holland will really squeeze up. And Holland, 74, had a goalkeeper who'd come out yards from goal, Jonblud. But all he would do was just boot the ball into the stands. Whereas Higita just does much more. You know, he's, and, and Maturana says, you know, we got Higita. We've got 11 footballers. And in this game, there are times that Higita comes out and plays on the right wing for a little bit, you know, and you can feel the reaction of the crowd. Like, wow, what is what 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 is this, you know? Uh, so, in in a way, they're, they're two quite similar teams. Hence, I think the stalemate. On one, you could argue that the Colombians at Nacional are a big disadvantage. Because their champ, the, the Colombian Championship has, has been suspended as a result of a referee getting shot, so they're going to this game with, with, without competitive games behind them. Um, but they equip themselves extraordinarily well, extraordinarily well. Because this is an important game for the Italians, you know. Th th this uh, old intercontinental thing, the Champions of Europe and South America, we always kind of in England try kind of treat it as a joke. Not true in Italy, you know. It's a big thing for them. Uh, and Nacional hold their own really, really well until I think there are two mistakes that they make that decide the destiny of the game. Which mistakes do you think I'm referring to, David? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. <clears throat> that is a good question. Um, I know... You know, the, the game goes deep for anyone who doesn't know what happens in the game. It goes deep, deep, deep into into extra time. Um, Maturana makes two two substitutions at half time. Um, one of which I think is a really positive one that that almost wins them the game, which is bringing on El Palomo uh, Albiero Usuriaga, um, uh, who helps keep, keep the game quite stretched. It's quite. You know, in the second half, Milan have a lot more of the ball, don't they, Tim? And they they start to crank it up a bit. But um, but first half's very even, and second half, Nacional still look dangerous on the break. But I think, I mean, in my head, what, watching it back, um, I felt like you know Atletico Nacional probably felt that they would might win on penalties. You know, they had Aguita. Um, he's not just a, a sort of maverick sweeper keeper. He's also a brilliant penalty kick expert, both at saving and at taking penalty kicks. They've just won the Copa Libertadores on penalties, um, in which he was absolutely the star of the show. Um, so I think you know, ever so slightly, you know, there was you know they were one minute away from hanging on to to, to get to, to penalties. Um, I, I think they also sort of started to do what Milan were doing, which was just got embroiled in a bit of a, a fouling match. Um, there, there are a lot of tasty tackles going in and it's a, it's a bit of a rash challenge. 
that that leads to the winning goal. Um, but Tim, please tell tell me. Well, tell me. In my view, the goal Higita makes a mistake lining his wall up, and he puts that was just, every, yeah. he just puts everyone in the wall, but he doesn't Do you know, co- he doesn't cover enough the post. No, I thought I thought and when he's, you he's said, unsighted, isn't he as well? Well, but when you were throwing that quiz question to David, I thought, no, you're not going to go for the obvious one. Obviously, obvious one, yeah, yeah <laughs> it's the obvious one, and it's such a shame no, because no. because it's the goal becomes something of an anti climax. I mean, he doesn't even make an attempt to save it because he just doesn't. Well, see first, it, he, you know? yeah, first he can't see it, and secondly, yeah. he, you know, his wall isn't 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 protecting him. Um, I, I I I love Vigita. Uh, he was he wasn't a clown. But he will be remembered for this and also for dropping a brick in 1990 against Cameroon. Having said that, had he been present in the 1994 World Cup, I think that the story would have been different. He was so important to the way that they played. He was, he was in prison. Unjustly, the Colombian state now recognises because he'd been called in to help negotiate with a hostage type situation. Uh, and he got there was a lot you, you couldn't profit from from kidnapping, which is a, still to this day I think a trauma in 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 Colombia. Um, and but he was so important to the way they play. And the fellow that he brought in to replace him, Oscar Cordoba, was a very competent goalkeeper, but couldn't do the sweeper thing. Was just absolutely lost. But the other one, and if this is more Maturana's view than mine, that there's there's a fellow here who I think exemplifies so much of this story. It's the star striker of Atletico Nacional, Usuriaga, who is, and a European audience won't have heard of him, but he was Asprilla cubed. He was as talented and he was as absolutely insane as, uh, as Asprilla. Uh, played with, with some success in Argentina afterwards with Independiente. Uh, tall figure lanky but very very skillful and he was the main goal scorer on in the, the when they won the libertadores he'd scored seven no one else had scored more than three so he's the star man but coach doesn't trust him doesn't trust him and remember that, that the system that they play the 442 high line everyone's got to be switched on you know if if the high line goes wrong if the press goes wrong then you've left so much of that space. And Maturana is always saying to his players, look, in our system, you cannot, during the game, be trying to spot your girlfriend up in the stands. <laughs> you can't do it. That's not how we play. You've got to be switched on. And Usuriaga just lived in his own little world, you know, lived in his own world. And it happens twice in two months because Colombia are also, they have to go through a playoff against Israel to qualify for, for, for the World Cup. Um, that was a month before, it was October, uh, or a couple of months before before this game. And they win in, in, in Colombia, and they've got to go to Israel. And he brings on Osuriaga second half. And he loses control. You know, they, in the end, they hang on grimly for a nil-nil draw. Uh, but it's, it's that he can't resist, because he's the, he's the best talent that we've got. So let's bring him on. But then he'll go walkies, he won't do his job, uh, and he won't close down uh, the, the opposing playmaker. And, and you've got to do this in order for our system to work. And then in this game against Milan, they're debating on the bench, him and Herman and Andario Gomez. Are we going to do it? Are we going to do it? Oh, come on, come on. So they do it. They bring him on again, second half. You know, Maturana himself says, I was swapping peace for possibility. Because, you know, with Usur- Usuriaga, w- without Usuriaga, everyone's doing their job and we're holding them comfortably. With Usuriaga, maybe we'll, we, we might we might win the game. And, and so he comes on and he does produce dangerous moments, but he doesn't close Barezi down. And so Barezi starts to boss the game. And then, you know, and Nacional survive with a succession of free kicks that they give away close to their goal. And Usuriaga is so much an example of Colombia during these crazy years because he he gets done for, I think he tests positive for for, for cocaine. Uh, and in the end, at the age of 37, he, he, he gets shot dead. He's another one that he's, these insane murder statistics 
in Colombia. I had a gun pulled on me once in Cali. Uh, I think I broke the, I'd, I'd, I'd done Ben Johnson's record, you know, even without a natural high. Fuck me, I ran, you know. And all Suriaga, I think he's in a da- he's in a gambling den, and and you know, there's quite why he was shot. I, I don't think it was ever really really found out. But at the age of thirty seven, he leaves us, and his his short life, uh, and all of the things swirling around him. There, I think there's so much a part of 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 the narco ball story. There's so many sort of cult cult heroes in in this period, and and players that the casual football fan will will know but won't know their full story. And and as Tim says, you know, so many of them had quite quite tragic ends or very dramatic twists in their career, and his was certainly one of them. It was one of the sort of what what if you know the the talent that never quite fulfilled itself. And then, as he says, he he was shot dead. Uh, in, in Cali, I think it was in Cali. Actually, um, I think the the final theory was that it was a, a hitman hired by a jealous boyfriend of someone he, a lover of his, or something. So it wasn't cartel related, but it was sort of vaguely cartel adjacent, I think. And and so much of what was going on was just wrapped up in all of that drugs, money, guns, violence, lawlessness at the time. So it was very hard for any of these players to avoid that. And and yet they had to be professional. They're playing in front of thousands of people. They're representing the hopes of a city, of a country. And as I say, I think that, that pressure, the context of that pressure just informs everything when you look back at these games. And I think from abroad, it was very easy to just, for example, in 94, maybe say, Oh, Pele, Pele's just gone a bit mad, hasn't he, saying Colombia could have won that World Cup. You know, they're just not that good. Um, but they were really good. And, and that victory in, in, in Buenos Aires was, you know, perhaps the high watermark of Colombian football and is still it's celebrated the worst, today. the worst thing that could have happened to them, didn't it? Yeah. Win, win 5-0. It was the worst thing that could have happened to them. They were suddenly so busy with all the promotional yeah. matches, beer sponsors getting them to play meaningless games. Um, then Pablo dies and, you know, everything's just kind of in disarray behind the scenes, but nobody from outside would be aware of that. And so when they went into that World Cup, you know, there was so much going on. Um, and again, that's kind of part part of the, the bigger story of the book and of Colombian football. But everybody, you know, everybody involved in football in Colombia would have felt that to some extent and, and nobody more so than, than the players and, and, and management at Atletico Nacional. In, in business terms, do you see this as the early years of the cartels? Because it, it's like it, it's like the years when there's this fight for domination before the market becomes consolidated, you know, which happens in all markets, doesn't it? And there's this ludicrous ostentatious ostentation well what's the point of being a being a a, a, a rich cartel uh, if, if everyone doesn't know how powerful i am you know it's uh, it's a little bit denzel washington in american gangster in the chinchilla coat you know it's the moment of his downfall when the, the, the chinchilla coat it's when people clock onto him but the, the colombian they want everyone to clock onto them you know because they're, they're, they're in that they're in the pr business as well so do you see this as the early far west years of the cartel business before it, it becomes more professional i mean i think uh, i think there's there's a slight difference between pablo and the medellin cartel and the carly cartel in in that regard and i think pablo was the one who had run for political office pablo was the one who was the most ostentatious who was the most public um, who was allowing the spotlight to shine on him the most brightly. I think Carly were interested in laundering money through the football club. And I think they got maybe a little bit wrapped up in the sort of um, arms race of football with with Pablo and El Mexicano. But I think it was definitely more Pablo that courted all of that um, and kind of raised the stakes on all of that. Um, but yeah, I think... Um, after he was killed and then when the Rodriguez Orejuela brothers were arrested in 95, by that point, you know, there doesn't seem to be much point in putting all their money into football anymore. You know, there's the, 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 the war on drugs and the DEA in America are sort of starting to get a bit of the upper hand. There are other priorities. I think for Carly, the priority was always make money, fly under the radar, get as rich as possible. Yes, spend that money and, you know, live an amazing life. 
but don't attract attention. And I think they fell out with Pablo in a big way because of his attitude that brought so much heat on them, specifically from America, um, specifically the risk of extradition and that war on drugs and, you know, the arrival of, of Bush in the White House, all those kind of things, um, I think meant that football became no longer the thing for them to use their energy and their resources on. But at, at this moment, they're sort of in the process of, of falling out the two cartels. Um, and I think the rivalry is quite intense. The football rivalry is quite intense. And as, as Tim mentioned earlier, um, America de Cali had just come off the back of winning five championships in a row and getting to three finals of the of the Copa Libertadores, but never winning it. Um, and I think for Pablo, if he could win the Copa where the Cali cartel had failed, um, I think that suddenly became a feather that he really, really wanted in in his cap. And so I think he did everything to help his team win that that Copa Libertadores. It, it's and, kind, and it's, it's, it's a little bit open for lot. them at, at this point because the global market has just opened up. So the, the Brazilians and the Argentines, they're going abroad in numbers. And you can see this in the Libertadores at around that time. Suddenly the winners on Uruguay stops winning in 88. That's the last Uruguayan win. Um, but suddenly the winners are coming from elsewhere like Colo Colo of Chile win, Olympia of Paraguay win, and then Atletico Nacional come through as well. So it's kind of a little bit open. F- uh, it, it's up for grabs at, at, around, uh, at around that time. With, with uh, America of, of Cali, you know, with the, the crackdown, uh, I remember being there for, for a derby and just people were irate because they were placed on with some other Colombian clubs, this thing called the Clinton List where they couldn't have a bank account. This is a big first division Colombian football club and they can't have a bank account. They can't have any 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 connection with the formal financial system because they're on this Clinton list, you know, which is uh, a crackdown on on finance linked to to terrorism and 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 drugs. Uh, and and some people in Colombia were very right, right about this because you know, how can the United States define who in our country has the right to have a bank account and, and, and who, who doesn't? I think there was yeah. definitely a, a, a sort of a, an antagonism, wasn't there, between the Colombian people and America in that period because, you know, America were very much sort of imperialistic power coming in and, and throwing their weight around. And I think the cartels certainly, and probably a lot of bystanders would say, well, cocaine is coming from Colombia, but it's going to America. You know, that's why you've got a problem with it. Right. We're the supply, you're the demand. You know, it's going to Miami, it's going to New York. The reason it's going there is because America is in love with cocaine, you know. So I've always felt a bit hypocritical, I think, to to the Colombians, the, the high-handed attitude of the American regime. Yeah, um, I don't think we've ever had a, a match where we've had to give so much of the background for the match, or maybe it's the foreground rather than the background to make the match make sense. Um, Just for all the reasons that we've uh, talked about, but specifically the fact that, you know, this game in particular um, is one of the highlights of the short career of Andreas Escobar. And I, I do get what you said earlier about the trauma and particularly, you know, um, having sort of heritage in Colombia as well, it must have been really disturbing because it was disturbing for us over here when he got shot uh, dead. So this would have been five years later than this. But this match that they lose 1-0, the Intercontinental Cup, how was that then uh, reacted? What was the reaction in Colombia, not least amongst the Medellin cartel, because it's a very different experience of losing this match than losing uh, the match in the World Cup against the USA. Um, Tim will probably know at least as much as I do about this, but um, I think, um, you know, what's interesting for me is that this match was not one I knew much about growing up, actually. As Tim says, it wasn't it wasn't something that was big on, you know, in England, in the UK, as a sort of as a tournament, as a uh, a, a match, a final. 
Um, so I'd followed the the national team results, um, but when I when I started um, developing this idea and started to research and write the book, is when I, I came across much more of the story of the Copa Libertadores campaign. That sort of asterisk put against that that win because of the impact of of Pablo and the bribing and threatening of referees during that that tournament. Um, and so this this game was really one that I came to after the fact. Um, and and was just you know amazed at the fact that I didn't really know very much about it, and that it was such an incredible AC Milan side, such a sort of peak Italian football side, um, uh, and that and that it was such a close game in the end. I think um, I can't speak for what Pablo might have thought, but I, f- I feel like he'd he'd won the Copa Libertadores, and that you know that was. Probably for once, that might have been good enough for him. I think I'm sure he would have loved to win this. I'm sure the fans of Atletico Nacional um, and a lot of people in Medellin and maybe a lot of people in Colombia would have wanted to win it. But perhaps I think mostly because of what happened in in the run up to it with with the kind of the tarring of all of Colombia with this brush uh, of being sort of criminal and dirty and you know cocaine and and drugs and cartels. So I think that was sort of the the feeling in that era was that that's all that people knew Colombia for. If uh, I could, if I could a, ask the question, yeah. perhaps in a different way, um, just forgive me. But if they had won, if Nacional had won this, would it have made any difference to either the narco landscape or you know the perception of Colombia in football? Would would there have been a different trajectory? I don't think it damaged their trajectory, so I'm mm. I'm not sure. I I think I think they were still on a good trajectory at this point. Um, the, the 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 drug money, despite all the pressure and criminality that came with it, was building a nucleus of young Colombian players, at, at especially at Atletico Nacional. Those players in this game went on to perform very well at Italia ninety and that's to, the, to that's, be that's the, the nucleus. Point, for, you know, that's that's the point that this is. Number one, this is a defeat with honour. Remember, they're not playing league games. So, no, this is, this is a terrific performance. And they nearly... So it's, it's a defeat with honour. But secondly, they got to the World Cup. They've only just qualified. So they're, they're, everyone is still on that high. And with the, the national team, you've got Valderrama. It's sometimes strange to think that Valderrama is not part of the national team because he's so associated with the the way that Colombia played at, at that at that time, and that was that was a great thing that Maturana did when he became coach of Colombia, because they never really had Colombian coaches; they always had Argentine coaches, and he always had that feeling that the Argentine coaches looked down their noses a little bit, didn't really believe in in Colombians, and that they, they would often, you know, that. There's, there's a little bit of edge that you know they're not serious, uh, yeah. and they would pick. You know, Maturana used to go on about this. They pick a defensive midfielder and leave Valderrama on the bench, and Maturana would say, "Look, we they're building the side on the basis that the uh, the opposition is more important than we are. No, no, we want to impose our way of playing the game on them. So we want the ball." So Valderrama plays. He's the first name on the team sheet. And one of the high points of this whole thing is the game they play against Germany in the 1990 World Cup. It's the third group game. Now, Germany have already qualified, so that takes a little bit off. Colombia need a draw. And for 90 minutes, Germany don't see the ball. And they're going to be the world champions. And they can't get the ball off Colombia. It's like Valderrama and Rincon, Valderrama and Rincon, Valderrama, dick, 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 tippity, 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 tippity. In the 89th minute, against the run of play, Germany score a goal. Colombia are out. Oh, no, they're not. Straight from the kickoff, Valderrama and Rincon, tippity, 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 goal. And it's almost as if, oh, yeah, yeah, that's the objective of the game, score a goal. You know, while they didn't need one, while they were, then they were kind of keeping the score in little flicks and stuff between themselves. And then suddenly they needed a goal and they went out and, and got one. Uh, and I know that uh, African football fans will disagree, but I would, I would have loved to have seen them beat Cameroon and, and go on and played England um, because that would have meant so much for them. The moment when they came of age is, is 88 in Wembley. It's so important for them, that game. It was only a friendly. 
It's so important for them, you know, to go to, to Wembley uh, and the, the temple of football. Here we are, Colombia. You know, no one's ever heard of us. And we and they went to Wembley and got, they got a fabulous 1-1 draw with, with Andres Escobar scoring, scoring the goal. So losing this game, I agree with Dave. It doesn't, it doesn't, I don't know what the trajectory would have been had they won it, it boot, perhaps it boosts Escobar's prestige even more. You know, look what I've done. Look, look, look what my children have done. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't a, really it a blow. More, it, would have more, it would have more impact, I think, on Pablo and the cartel than it would on the football fans, I think, and, and the country and the players. Um, I, was, I was lucky enough to be at Wembley in 88. Um, my my mum got us tickets to go and sit with the Columbia fans up in the gods in Wembley. And um, Valderon would just absolutely like cast a spell over that pitch. It's and true. he just had every range of pass in his locker. And it was just, the ball was just, you know, he just move it wherever he wanted it to, yeah, it would go. And as you, as you said, that was Andres Escobar's only ever international goal for Colombia in that game. Um, and it was a really creditable 1-1 draw. And a lot of people watching it, I think, gained a new appreciation for, for mm. Colombian football, but not many people did watch it. And so in, in Italian 90, they were very much an unknown quantity. Um, and that, that Valderrama story is, is, is again part of the story of Colombian football and of this era and, and of what happens in the book is his, his sort of rise and his ability to be a key component in that team alongside people like Iguita and Andres Escobar, his ability to dictate the way they play, the pace that they play, um, and then the fact that, you know, by the end of that generation, you get to France 98 and he's just not the same player anymore. And he kind of exemplifies the decline in the post-cartel world of, of Colombian football that they've, they've never replaced him. They haven't got anybody like him, but they're still trying to play the same system with him in it. Um, you've got Espria now, but he gets sent home from that World Cup. He falls out with the then manager who was Maturana's assistant for many years um, and he gets sent home. And so that that's kind of the end of that generation, really, that that late 80s, early 90s sort of golden generation of Colombian football, which basically is the Valder, the Valderrama years, really. And what, and what happened subsequently to Colombian club football is, you look at it now, it's a disaster zone, I think. Uh, on the Colombian national side, they're doing extremely well, extremely well. No one plays in Colombia. Uh, and all the clubs, the clubs are the, the kind of businesses, a lot of them. Um, the, the share structure got all kind of uh, decimated to try, and, to try and squeeze the drug money out. I don't know, I don't know how successful that, that's been. But the only thing they want to do now is sell players. That's the only activity that, that seems to matter in, in, in Colombian football now. So, you know, it's a big country, lots of urban centres, you know, could be bigger than Argentina in football terms. Um, but um, the, the clubs are just dreadful, dreadful. As soon as someone comes up, he's sold. And the rise of Major League Soccer is just worse than that even more, you know, because they've got another place to sell to. So it's disappointing to see Colombian football these days because there's, there's no real ambition to, to create good teams. It's just sell players as quickly as possible. Do they again, know... Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. You go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, it's one, it's one of the sort of contradictory things that I wanted to get into in the book is the sort of the positive, for want of a better word, yeah. impact of Pablo and the Narcos on Colombian football, which is building pitches in the barrios, giving kids opportunities, creating a, 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 a Colombian-based side and a Colombian manager and an identity that then led to a sort of real way of playing. And also that ability to pay and retain talent. Um, and, and as soon as the money, cartel money started to, to go away and, and Pablo was dead and, and the Cali cartel were kind of under siege, um, that, you know, you started to see those much more of the player exodus happening. The money wasn't really there to retain them. The talent had always been there, but now, you know, the money was abroad. And, and it's around that time that you get Faustino Espria going, overseas and first to Parma and then of course to Newcastle and and you know since then you've seen a regular uh you know crop of, of talented Colombian footballers across the European leagues but but back then you know most of them were playing in Colombia which is very very different you had you had Valderrama playing at Montpellier um 
but almost everybody else was Atletico Nacional or Deportivo Cali or, you know, one of the other sides, Millonarios. Um, so they, they did have a huge impact on that that era's development. And, and again, with writing the book, I wanted to kind of get into all of that, how it was inextricably linked for good and bad in, in a strange way. Well, the book is a book that we've been talking about, Narco Ball, and it's by our guest who's taken us, uh, I think, into every corner and aspect of the background and the um, circumstances to which uh, this match that we're talking about is displayed. Anyway, David Arrowsmith um, is our guest. It's Love, Death and Football in Escobar's Colombia. And uh, David... Um, 17th of December 1989, AC Milan versus Atletico Nacional is the match that we've looked at um, today. Uh, we always have a, a musical slant to um, our podcast so that people can hear what the soundtrack of the era was. And I can see from your haircut that you probably are on top of the musical landscape, which is good. A uh, good haircut always uh, works well. <laughs> but I've got to ask the obvious question. As it's 17th of December, this match, do they know it's Christmas? <laughs> no, um, no, I remember. No, I remember no, I re <laughs> Go on. I, I remember that. I remember Live Aid well. Um, I would say, uh, despite the slightly indie haircut, I probably was more on the pop end of this uh, hit parade uh, <laughs> list of tracks than, than the cool end back then. I was only uh, nine, uh, ten, ten years old when uh, this match was taking place. We're, so, we're uh, gonna, yes. we're going to come on to Jive Bunny and the Master. Yeah, see, see, see I, I, I think with, we should start maybe with the, with the thing that gives us a direct connection from your subject, and that's Manchester because some of the produce of Colombia was was uh, being consumed, shall, shall we say, in, in the north of England. And you've got on the, the, the Happy Mondays. Are just Everywhere flying. else as well. I've got to go up there sometime, Tim. <laughs> you pointed out as no, the I bloke who didn't say a word well, when you pointed out that they were consuming a lot up their noses in those days. We all were. Well, not, not me. Uh, no, I hasten to add. I hasten to add. Um, yeah, although not me, but the many other people in the country well, were. Th this is the first. This is the, the kind of breakthrough record of the Happy Mondays. That EP, that Manchester EP with 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 Hallelujah, uh, which is that you know the kind of house piano uh, and the, the marriage of the house piano and the indie sound and and this is kind of a, a new religion going on here of 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 uh, of, of of drugged out loons. Um, and Stone Roses, Fool's Gold, which is their is their big record, um, and then you know they spend how many years making a making a second album, and they've lost their audience by by that time. Um, so you know it's that I think is I the would, most obvious connection. I don't think um, I think in the top ten, Get a Life, Soul to Soul, for me would be the most obvious uh, connection, not least because of everything you've sold. Uh, you've told us, but also to sort of reflect the fact that uh, Colombian football at this time was a matter of life and death <clears throat> as well. But Soul to Souls Get a Life, very different. That was their third single, third or... It's the or start of their decline for single. me. It's the first one, no. I think. I don't really like this. No, yeah, but you didn't get it, mate, because this is jazz. This is jazz. This is... <sighs> Jazzy B has created a new style of rap with this track. If you listen again, honestly, it's amazing what he's done. Maybe it doesn't sound as fresh today on reflection as it did at the time, but you listen to all the rappers. They weren't doing anything like this. He was creating something that was uniquely very much like Soul to Soul, the sound system were at the time, which was a kind of a soul jazzy crew, as it were, where he gets his name from. And he recreated the way that people do rap records and a lot of people took from him. I would argue that the way that he does it is the very beginning of what becomes or ultimately becomes grime music. Um, it, he's taking it, it away from the Yanks on this it one. It made the Jungle Brothers furious. They absolutely it hated can, it. But remember, they had to come over here, the Jungle Brothers, to get props. And they were reinvented from the raw produce that came over from the United States. The Jungle Brothers were remixed here in the UK. 
That's how they got big. So they can't be sort of dissing uh, invention from the USA. But number nine is the standout track is in the charts in the top 10. The number nine, Linda Ronstadt and Aaron Neville. I didn't give two hoots about Linda Ronstadt till I heard this. And Aaron Neville, who I've interviewed before, the, the voice great. of an angel, genuinely the voice of the angel. Uh, of you know, an you angel. know why, I, why I love Linda Ronstadt? I mean, it's not really my stuff. No, she's a massive star in the States in the mid 70s. And she say, looks around and thinks, you know what? These stadium gigs, they're shit. It's not right. So she just turns her back on the whole thing. Because I want to do it. You know, what's the point of doing these big stadium gigs? They're not venues for music. You shouldn't do music in stadiums. And she just goes back and does what she wants to do. And, and I think that's, that's, that, that's brilliant. There are some bands that work in the stadium um, and I'm sure Oasis will work very well next year when they're counting all their gazillions from uh, the, the point. hyped up yeah, stadium gigs that they're going to be doing. There, there are some. I mean, the Rolling Stones, they've been at it for so long now mm -hmm. that they can actually you know, do music for a stadium but also know how to get all the rigging so it sounds not too bad, but you're right. You know, although music should be enjoyed in the open air, I would say the best sound systems I've ever been to were in Jamaica, where it's always in the open air, where they strap up their strings to the light, electricity from the telegraph pole or whatever it is. It's the best way to enjoy music. Uh, maybe the sultry, you know, evening uh, atmosphere gives it something as well. But, um, but stadiums, yeah, I, I tend to agree with you on that. But that track... Don't know much. I mean, phew, it, it just tears at your heartstrings sometimes. That track. It's so beautiful. It's so. It's a work of art for me. In any case, um, but apart from that, the rest of the charts I can live without. I suppose you've got to take I'm some responsibility. Talk about rap. You've got to take some responsibility for the Swedish effort. You must. Oh, in terms of uh, which group was that? Rob and Raz featuring Layla K. You see, I didn't even know that was Swedish. Are they oh, Swedish, yeah. are they? Yeah, the whole thing is Swedish. I didn't Swedish. even know that. Yeah, oh, Robin Ray is Swedish. Leila Kay is Swedish of Moroccan heritage. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's that kind of pump up the jam, kind of Brooklyn. Well, you know, it's just, yeah. just reeks of, 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 of clowns and falsitude, and falsitude. How about taking responsibility for De La Soul's The Magic Number? Mm -hmm. uh, number 25, which is a sample of a much better track. Mm -hmm. Um or taking control, or sorry, taking responsibility for Lisa Stansfield, who at this time, was it at this time? It was just after this time, a month later, me and Lisa Stansfield genuinely tick, tick. were rocking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And pe people thought you were Jazzy P. Hey, That's tick. right. Yeah. At the Soul Train Awards. Yes. In, that was 1990, January 1990. So, uh, just I've been all around before. the world and I can't forget that story. <laughs> yeah. I've heard it so many times. Well, she, she was a lot of fun, to be honest, in those days. So if you're listening, uh, Lisa, give me a call. What's the matter? Um, she just sucks out that, that you're not Jazzy B. There's no reason to call you. Yeah, exactly. David, <laughs> apart from that, that was harsh from Tim there, actually. That was so low, you can't imagine. <laughs> what, what, what were you into at the time, David? And what was your musical trajectory afterwards? Yeah. So I was, so I was born in 79, um, as I tend to say. I came in with Thatcher. Uh, for better or worse um and um so i uh, back back at this period i would have been probably probably just about weaning myself off listening to sort of capital fm recording stuff on cassette off the radio um i used to go when i went to columbia with my mum in the 80s until it got a bit too dangerous to go i used to go and visit family um, and I used to take my Walkman and a whole bag full of cassettes because you used to have to travel, you know, with a bag this big just to listen to a few albums. And I used to have things like Michael Jackson and Salt and Pepper and stuff like that on there. I, I definitely did have Jive Bunny's album on cassette. I, ha I hang my head in shame, but but Don't I worry. did. <laughs> You've got youth on your um, side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, we'll so take I was probably hearing a lot of a lot of Phil Collins and Lisa Stansfield on the radio. I remember those songs very well probably still watching neighbors so jason and kylie obviously looming large in everyone's consciousness then um i came to all the all the cool stuff you know in, in my teens so just a few years later started to get more into indie and hip-hop and rock um so yeah subsequently discovered people like the stone roses and and de la soul and 
and uh you know more uh adult bands shall we say but yeah i was a uh, on still, you know, still a pre-teen when, when this game was happening. Um, it was more when when it was USA '94. That was when I was really listening to to music for myself, you know. Um, so yeah, this a lot of songs I recognise on on the uh, the chart at this time because um, it was very pop, very pop centric, wasn't it? Any any yeah. Colombian influence in your? Because I mean, these years are also, especially I think, with the national team playing on the Caribbean coast there, that's the searing heat of Barranquilla. It just goes together with salsa. And, uh, you know, watching the Valderrama side, that, that hypnotic repetition of, of salsa, you could see that on the field as well. You know, I know Colombian, Colombian music can be very, very formulaic and, you know, there's that genre and that genre and that genre. Did any of these genres play into your music taste? Um, as a as a child, um, I think again it took it took me a few more years to kind of find my identity. I think you know when you're very young, um, growing up in the UK as someone who's got you know a fiercely patriotic Colombian mother and an English father, and just going to school in London, you know you probably start off wanting to fit in, and then as you get a little bit older, you embrace your own identity, and you realise that being the, the Colombian guy can be quite fun, can be quite cool, and that you embrace your your motherland. Um, and so, it, again, it, t- it took me a few years to get there to then just start to explore a little bit more. It kind of, I guess, coincided really with the the explosion of Shakira um, in the '90s. You know, when when you come from a country that isn't one of the global powerhouses in any particular world, you know, of of arts and culture and sport suddenly those exports that go global become so huge you know so so Shakira was a great figurehead for Colombian music and then through that you end up realizing there are lots of other people more traditional people like Carlos Vives or Toto La Mompocina people like that that helped me connect with my my musical cultural heritage and then you sort of you know I got addicted to watching Formula One but only when Juan Pablo Montoya was racing you know, I didn't really have an. I, I watched it with you know with Damon Hill and and you know a bit of Schumacher in the early you know all of those early days when it was a you know it was fun to watch. But suddenly, when there was a Colombian racing in Formula One for the first time, it was a whole nother level. And I'd stay up and I'd watch Brazil Grand Prix qualifying and you know stuff like that um, because it became a matter of, of national pride, of patriotism, of me connecting with with yeah that love that I got for the country from from my mother. Um, so I think all of that plays into it. And and my mother sadly passed just over a month ago. Um, so she's, the book is, is, is dedicated to her. I'm glad she got to see it um, in print. Um, Cause it's very much comes from that childhood that I had growing up and gaining that, that patriotism for Colombia from her, even though I was growing up in the UK, you know, luckily that's also a football mad country. So those two things, you know, really, really came together. Um, and it was really through her that, that I gained all of that interest in in my motherland. And we still have Colombian food every Christmas Eve. We make ajiaco, which is a delicious Colombian soup, stew, dish um, that, that we have as a family tradition. So, yeah, it, it's infused more and more of my life and my identity, I think, as I, as I got older. But I think that that moment really where it, it coalesced and crystallized was around that 94 world cup you know that was the moment of potential greatest pride for me um and then the sort of biggest disaster and most public you know disaster you could imagine um but i think from that moment on i I have felt kind of fused and bonded with that identity well look your mother sounds like she was an amazing woman first of all because the times that you've mentioned her over this conversation i was like i wouldn't want to mess with her but um you know and it's an excellent tribute to her this book and uh i'm nowhere near finishing it uh but i will do and um thank you because you, this podcast is like a tribute to your mum as well you know if i might say that in the nicest of ways so we've been talking about the uh and i i love saying the intercontinental cup because it was one of those trophies from when i was younger that i never understood what it was or why and i'm not sure if i still ever called the intercontinental cup over here never what was it called over there the world club championship 
Oh, right. Okay. That's, well, that, that's, still, that's what it is. That's what it is for, for the South Americans. You know, they are fighting to be the best team in the world. Yeah, I still don't understand. But uh, Intercontinental Cup, though, was more about Europe and uh, South America. Yes. And yeah, arguably the, 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 the World two Cup traditional is con- well, but, Yeah, the, the yeah, two but, traditional contents. But if you're going to call it Intercontinental World, you've got to include some other continents, mate, you know. So I'm not sure if that's well, like the, the World was Series, that isn't it? They didn't matter and they wouldn't win anyway. So <laughs> also Rams, yeah, yeah, absolutely. What oh my goodness! Also, I love that it was also called the Toyota Cup because they were the sponsors. Well, we and, saw uh, that. If you, if you yeah. we if saw you the car the match, on the pedestal. Yeah, it, it, that's what I was going to say. The Toyota, what was it? A, a Carina, <laughs> a, a white Toyota Carina on a pedestal by the running track around the pitch. It just shocking. takes you back to those days, doesn't it? It is just <laughs> shocking, blatantly. You know, they're more interested in selling cars than in playing football. But anyway. Thank you very much for taking us. The 17th of December, 89, AC Milan versus Atletico uh, Nacional. And it is, I suppose, part of the landscape of the book Narco Ball that we've been talking about with our guest, David Arrowsmith. Thank you very much, David. Cheers, Tim. Thank you both.